this is something I can do, this is something I want to do. Coming up on Arts District, we're showcasing the work of student producers at our partner colleges and universities across Colorado. Pulling a town with a light Past the park and it swings First, Durango meets Nashville, one star's unique journey to Music City. Step out of the car and put on my magic coat. And they were in Nashville, so they weren't going to come to me. I had to go to them. Plus, the art of craft drinks and conversation. When people see fire on their drink, they ask questions. Fly fishing as a way of life. Starting to teach my older son to tie flies and murals inspire inside the walls of a correctional facility. And I want people behind the walls to have a life. That's all ahead. I'm Michael Gadlin. Welcome to my studio. And I'm Kate Ferdoni. Thanks for joining us on Arts District. Our team is small, but it's mighty. And we're committed to bringing you some of the best of what Colorado has to offer in arts and culture. And to help train the next generation of arts storytellers. Our team joined regional producers in university classrooms across the state. Guiding students as they created their own stories about artists in their communities. Now we're sharing those stories with you. Our first story takes us from Southern Colorado to Music City, USA. We meet Chris Patine, city councilor by day and country music artist by night. We follow his journey to create a new identity along with some soulful country tunes. Fort Lewis College student and filmmaker Will Langston brings us this story. Country is one of the few types of music that really affects people emotionally. You know, you, you don't find yourself listening to rock and roll music and, you know, tears coming to your eyes or feeling that sort of emotional component very much. It's about real people's lives and it is relatable. My name is Chris Bettine and my day job is I own a real estate company and a property management company that does vacation rental management. I have dabbled in politics. I'm a city councilor for Durango, Colorado. Uh, stewardship of that has been amazing. Music entered my life when I was young. I started playing instruments from the first opportunities that I could. I played guitar eventually. By the time I was 11, I was in guitar lessons. And, and then the guitar teacher said that I would never learn to play guitar. <laughs> so he kicked me out of lessons. That was the auspicious beginning of my guitar background. Honestly, that kind of started me off on trying to write my own music. Being in Colorado is a big part of the music on some level because I think the backdrop to most of my life experience has been here. I ended up in Durango, Colorado for college, which is where I live now. My first album was actually a duo with a guy named Tyler Gummersall. And Tyler's the producer on this record that we're talking about, Life of Crime. Uh, he produced my next record, which will hopefully come out next year, and he plays guitar, among other instruments, on the record. And he's really contributed a ton to it. I mean, if it wasn't for Tyler, I don't think any of us would have been in that space doing what we've been doing. Tyler was in Nashville when we did our first record, and he uh, you know, had relationships with all these folks and was able to put this band together and they were in Nashville, so for me, they weren't going to come to me. I had to go to them, and that's why we went there. We had, you know, some world-class musicians on the record. 
Um, Brad Pemberton is the drummer who plays with Steve Earle. He used to play with Ryan Adams and the Cardinals, some of my favorite all-time musicians. Um, Dave Jakes is the bassist. Uh, he plays with John Prine. He's been his bassist for 30 years. Um, uh, Jen Gunderman is uh, the keyboardist. She plays with Cheryl Crow. She's a professor of music at Vanderbilt University. Getting to go to Nashville is like living another life in some ways. You know, it's probably appropriate that I have a, a stage name because it, it's like being another person. My alter ego's name is Robert Kent Voss. And it's, I need one because my name, Chris Bettine, is a little hard for people to pronounce. My stage name came from uh, a situation when my son was born, he had some genetic issues and I was adopted so didn't really know what my genetic history was. So uh, because he had those issues, I went and did some research and found uh, my original birth certificate. So I found that name, Robert Kent Foss. That seemed like a natural name to use. Life of Crime is uh, sort of the basis of the album. That song is foundational to it. it. It really, it comes out of the experience of having a child that, you know, had some issues uh, early on in life. And, and certainly the child in that song is very autobiographical to me. And it also comes out of this idea that, um, you know, the crime in life sometimes isn't literal, that a lot of the things that we do intentional or not, or maybe crimes against ourselves, crimes against the people we love, um, certainly in that song, it's uh, it, the protagonist is someone who's really struggling with the things that he's done to his family, and he's going back home for uh, the funeral of his son. I mean, it's a very dark, dark song. I can't dredge that image up when I'm performing that song because if I do, I won't get through it. So I should think about some other story, you know, when I'm playing it. I have to get a little edge in there. I have to think a little bit about it, you know. I pull in a town with a light Past the park in its swing Couldn't see our house through these walling years I could feel you in everything Stepped out of the car and put on my magic So, Kate, have you ever thought about using a stage name for your music? Oh, okay. So, actually, I've gone by the moniker Katie Sleeveless since I was, like, a teenager. Like this? Yes! Slice them off! I love it! <laughs> My favorite alter ego of all time, though, is Garth Brooks when he did the whole Chris Gaines thing. Oh, I totally remember the Chris Gaines moment. Yeah. Short-lived, and I learned this musician's stage name is a way of him honoring his heritage. Yes, so cool. And we're really thrilled to hear that his son Dylan is doing great and actually following in his father's footsteps by writing music of his own. You can find out more of Chris's, or shall we say Robert's, music online. Okay, bartenders in this day and age are definitely artists. If you've ever seen any of those finer craft drinks being put together, you know it is no small task. Meanwhile, they are also mastering the art of conversation. Fort Lewis College sophomore Peyton Ratowski, who is not quite old enough to even drink yet, introduces us to the sensory experience of crafting fine drinks. What I wish I had more for bartending is time with people, time to get to know them. You're busy making drinks throughout the evening and uh, you just get brief moments to meet people. You can learn a lot from everybody. And uh, here at the Ore House, we, we serve a lot of successful people. There's a lot to be learned from our customers. My name is Mark Daly. I'm a bartender and I work at the Ore House in Durango, Colorado. One of 
our most popular drinks is called the Desperado. We're from the Southwest, so I always like having a margarita on our cocktail list, and it's quite fun. And it's, once again, a very simple process and uh, done in a classic style. We, uh, we just take a house-smoked green chili, and it's a process of, of letting the tequila and the chili just blend together for a few days, not too long, or it becomes too strong. And uh, then just fresh lime juice that we squeeze daily and uh, some organic agave nectar and Cointreau. And then we burn a sage leaf on top for your garnish, which smells, you know, gives off a, a wonderful odor to the bar. And when people see fire on their drink, they ask questions. For our AKA fancy boys, we call them, that we use in old fashions and in like a Manhattan or, or a, a whiskey or bourbon or anything, a spirit on the rock. We'll simply boil water, put it into a cooler, and probably, you know, probably four big pots of water, and we'll let it sit there for two and a quarter days. We pull it out of the fridge and let the ice sweat a little bit. What happens in the fridge is the water separates, so the impurities fall to the bottom. There's a top layer that freezes, so we crack it out of the cooler and then put it on a cutting board and score it with a knife and we actually have ice cutters and we tap the ice cutters making ice cube blocks that'll fit into uh, three different sizes of glasses and they're clear so that's what's really special about them you can see right through the ice cube they're beautiful yeah I am definitely a people person I have fun making drinks so I I try and share that with the customers, you know, and they enjoy it. There's a lot of times when I, I can't say a word and I'm a gabby guy, you know. To hear people say they're enjoying themselves immensely just watching me go through the mechanics of making several cocktails is quite entertaining. And, uh, you know, I laugh and giggle and, you know, sometimes make mistakes. And I try and share that with the people in the bar around me because I'm serving an entire restaurant drinks. Just can't live without you. Daly's got back. Tony, come back. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes people do get involved with that and they ask questions all along the way. Occasionally you might forget a, you know, a thing or two and have to start over again. But yeah, it's a, it is very interactive nowadays with the customers. So you never know what anybody is going to order. You, know, you could find the big, burly, rugged mountain man coming through the door, sitting down and ordering a Cosmopolitan, you know? There's no right or wrong, and if it's what somebody wants, I'm glad to make it. I'm, I'd be more happy to make you what you want than to stray you too far from you. I think that's what makes a good bar. in Durango. What a cool atmosphere. You know what I want to do? I want to sit at Mark's mm. bar and kind of take in that burning sage. Mm, delightful. I feel like yeah. you guys would get along. Yes, oh, and totally perhaps would. you could have one of those Desperados as a signature drink. And good. you can pay Mark a visit. Check out the link for more. They say a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. <laughs> but the anglers in our next story don't even have to worry about that at all because fishing is actually their job. Lucky. Carson Randolph, a student at Fort Lewis College, takes us to Duranglers. It's a fly fishing shop that will get you hooked on the art and heart of fly tying. I think some people would classify fly tying as an art form. Some people might just classify it as a utilitarian aspect of fly fishing. I would say it's an art form because you can be as creative with it as you want and you can go above and beyond what it requires to catch a fish. More than just mimicking a trout food or any fish food, you can create beautiful works of art. 
I think a lot of people really enjoy the idea of tying something and then connecting with the fishing by catching a fish with something they created. I continue to tie because it's a challenge. Even though I think it might look awesome, a uh, fish might hate it. Tricking a fish into thinking something is real is really quite interesting to me. My name is Andy McKinley and I work at Durangler's Flies and Supplies. I became interested in fishing when I was 11. My grandpa took me to a sports show. I saw a couple guys tying flies there and I was like, oh, that's really cool. What are they doing? And it kind of just I absorbed into them for like an hour. I thought that this is something I can do. This is something I want to do. I started fly fishing a year later, tying flies right around the same time. Equipment needed for fly tying, you're going to need a vise, scissors, a bobbin, which is something that holds the thread, whip finisher, or a half hitch tool. And those are used just to tie the knot as you finish the fly so it doesn't come unraveled. Generally speaking, there's going to be dry flies. Uh, they're called dry flies, obviously nothing's dry, but it floats on top of the water. Uh, a wet fly is something that sinks into the water, kind of down to where trout are if they're not coming up to eat something. Hackle is the feather that you would wrap on a hook, and that's, a, uh, depending on what you're uh, looking to do, the hackle as you wrap it on um, has an effect of splaying out small fibers that help that fly float, uh, mimic part of an insect. There is a benefit to using real feathers versus synthetic depending on what you're trying to imitate. Um, real feathers can offer quality of especially UV properties. Uh, looks more natural in the water than synthetic stuff. I think the most memorable stuff is just kind of comes from teaching people and learning more about it for myself. Starting to teach my older son to tie flies has been one of my favorite things to do. I hope he pours himself into something um, that interests him as much as, you know, I have an interest in fly fishing and fly tying. I love the community of fly fishing. There's a lot of people who fly fish that I've met who are lifelong friends. I just love the creative aspect of it. There's so many different ways to approach a piece of water, um, and I don't think I've learned them all, and I think everyone has a little bit different way of doing it. It kind of depends on your personality and what you love. I think there's so much to learn about just fish behavior and the natural world at large, and it's a great connection to that. This is really touching. Carson dedicated this film of her, for her grandfather, actually, Cliffy, Aww. and he was a fly fisherman. Thank you for showing us that, Carson, that special relationship between a person and the river. So beautiful. Yes, it is. And if you want to try your hand at fly fishing, like me, and I don't know if that's correct, <laughs> but you can find more information at the link. Michael's going to visit that link later. I think I should. <laughs> Get some tips. <laughs> Finally, life inside prison walls. It might conjure up images of a stark and dreary environment with bars and concrete walls. But inmates at the Colorado Department of Corrections are changing that picture one color at a time by transforming those walls into vibrant works of art. A team of students from CSU Pueblo explored how artwork inside a corrections facility can encourage and inspire the human spirit. If all of our walls were painted one single color, if our homes were void of art and paintings, we would live in starkness. There's a reason we decorate. Art on our walls transforms our space. It makes home a place where we find comfort and beauty amongst the chaos. Now, apply that to corrections. Imagine not being able to see an ocean or a forest just simply because you can't get there. When you're incarcerated, you're confined. Imagine your mindset if you spent day and night staring at blank, sterile walls. 
Now imagine those same walls covered with murals. I think idleness and starkness are our enemy of the prison system. We have advanced that, unfortunately, I think, in this country of creating prisons as a place of idleness and starkness. I just think it's the wrong direction. You go in to see what you typically would find in a prison, uh, you know, security, you have uh, structure, you, you don't see beauty. It makes it very sterile. Murals date back to prehistoric days where large surfaces were used to depict life's events. Fast forward thousands of years, and we find that the purpose of murals has remained the same, to paint a picture of society. Over the course of history, people have been using murals as a way to show that they exist. What better place to remind someone that they still exist than behind the walls of prison? Murals aren't everything. I mean, they're not, they're not gonna solve all of our problems by any stretch. They're just an expression of this journey that they're on. They've had some pretty tough journeys. The main population of people behind the walls have been on a very, very rough road. That's theirs to own, but I think our part as a department is to say, you have an opportunity to change your journey, and you can express that through art, music, poetry, through other things, way of expressing it. It's hard being away from family, but it's a path that I have to take right now. And I'm going to live the best I can. Every class of individual that comes through and sees your murals, you have to bring a sense of peace, a sense of happiness, a sense of beauty. We all have that artistic bond, I believe, you know, somehow, in some way, that it helps the person get a little bit more cohesive with their self. You know, I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, so, you know, I would hope that it has an effect, though. I believe in redemption for broken people and for broken circumstances. Most of us have had those moments in our life. Most of us don't go to prison over them, but go through live long enough and you'll have some things broken in your life. In those moments, you're looking for, do I get a second chance? Do I get an opportunity for redemption? I know I've done a lot of wrong, so I don't sit around and try to blame the system or other people for something I gotta be responsible for. But at the same time, you want people in an ethical point of view to treat other people as human beings. Sometimes there's a little bit more to look at than just your situation here and the here and now. I don't want to be here. No one wants to be in prison, but this is a place for me to just leave it every once in a while. That's a really good impact. It opens my mind, it opens my heart. Don't complicate things too much, you know, when, when things can be so simple and at the same time you could be doing better for yourself in or out, I guess, incarceration. Uh, for the ones that are in, I'd like to say, you know, do the best you could do and enable yourself to be a better man or woman for society. Some of the murals I've seen in the facilities, I'm like, mm, that's probably not the one I would have done, but it doesn't have to be the one that I would have done. It has to be the one that, that's created out of their space. I go to the library and look at different books, and visually it helps because I, I don't get much stimulation. I'll take ideas that I see and I'll try to combine them, but you know, I turn them into the way I want them. Most people think in words. For me, I think in images associated with those words. What is the imagery? How do I compile that into an image that, that defines those words? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, yes. How do you make something that's gonna be beautiful to everyone? It becomes like a puzzle. Some things may not be beautiful to one or another, but you have to find that balance. Psychologically, you know, not physically, because I'm stuck in a prison, I tend to relate a lot easier. It gives me a purpose and self-worth. Wasn't always proud of the guy I seen in the mirror. In fact, I was embarrassed by him. But through this process, I can look in the mirror now and say, you know, I can make a contribution. There has to be something for people to get up for in the morning. That's the key. There has to be a reason why you get up this morning. And art's a way of expressing the world we live in, the dilemmas we have, the, the troubles we have. What is art but to be shared with others and to bring meaning to life? 
hear a really good song, see a really good theater practice, and there's something where it takes you in a place and it, it changes you. I just think behind the walls, by removing that, we've removed one of the most humanizing expressions. And I want people behind the walls to have a life. It's really wonderful that they're given an opportunity to really express their talent. Yeah, I'm there. heartened that this oh. creative outlet exists and that incarcerated sure. folks can have this experience. For sure. As we saw, having that creative outlet can shift your focus, right? So thanks to the students at CSU Pueblo for creating that story. And thank you so much for watching us on Arts District. We're excited to continue working with these young arts journalists, and we couldn't do it without the support of these schools and their faculty and you. We've added all of these stories and more from our student producers on our website. That's right. Don't forget to check out our Instagram page. I'm Kate Perdoni. And I'm Michael Gadlin. Until next time, make it easy. Bye. Make it. it.